I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Logsdon, who is Professor Emeritus of Pol Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University, where he was on the faculty for 38 years and was the founder and director of the university's Space Policy Institute in 1987. His main interests lie in political and historical aspects of both the US and international space programs. And he is the author of several books on the topic, most notably the award-winning John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon in 2010. He is considered an expert in his field and is frequently consulted for his views and has written many articles on the topic. Dr. Logsdon is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Planetary Society and held the Charles A. Lindbergh Chair in Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in 2008 and 9. He also served as a member of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. He is the recipient of many distinguished awards, including the 2013 Frank Molina Astronautics Medal from the International Astronautical Federation, as well as the 2005 John F. Kennedy Award from the American Astronautical Society. Today he's here to discuss the topic of his latest book, After Apollo, Richard Nixon and the American Space Program. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Logsdon. Thank you, and thanks, Michelle, for inviting me back. I gave a talk like this on the Kennedy book in 2012, I think, 11 or 12, and, and really enjoyed it. So I, I welcome the opportunity to talk to this group again. One of the things that, seeing the group gather uh, outside, I say, I better explain history, because the, <laughs> the average age in here uh, post-states Richard Nixon uh, and his presidency. And so, I mean, there are a few of us in this room that experienced this firsthand. Most of you, it is really history. So I'll try not to assume very much as I go through. This is a strange book because it took me 38 years, no, really uh, 45 years to finish. Uh, so students, if you don't get papers done on time, you know, there's still hope. In another 45 <laughs> years, you'll finish. Uh, I, I, I published a first book, which was my PhD dissertation, called The Decision to Go to the Moon in 1970. And the then number two at NASA, a man named George Lowe, said, uh, we're in the middle of a crazy decision process. Why don't you uh, take a look at that and provided some NASA funding. So I did a bunch of interviews of, of Nixon administration officials and senior NASA people in the 70, 71, 72 period, began writing and then got sidetracked to a whole different career. So it was not really until I retired from full-time teaching seven years ago that I could go back first do the Kennedy book and now this one. So uh, it, it's a much richer uh, book because of the delay. Uh, the pap Richard Nixon's papers are uh, uh, now available in the Nixon Library in scenic Yorba Linda. I spent a fair amount of time down there while I was doing this book. And of course, the Nixon tapes are now public and, and, uh, and provide background. So maybe for the first time, some of you will hear uh, Nixon talking on his, his notorious Nixon tapes. Um, well, we'll see what else I have to explain as we go along. First thing to realize was, was Kennedy set the lunar landing goal in May of 61, the Apollo 8 uh, mission, December of 68, Nixon had been elected president but not yet sworn in, made it very clear we were going to land on the moon soon uh, and that we would have to, the president would have to make some decisions on what to do after Apollo. Um, those decisions, I will argue, uh, this is my, if you want, hypothesis or bottom line, the decisions that Nixon made most of them relatively negative. This is not going to be very exciting, unfortunately, because it talks about how the program got to where it is today. Uh, and, and particularly, I should say, human spaceflight. Um, uh, I think Nixon's decisions uh, have had a more list lasting impact than Kennedy's decision to go to the moon, although Kennedy is the hero, the space visionary, which he was not. Uh, so, but first, uh, it was clear that we were going to land on the moon. It turned out to be six months to the day after Nixon was sworn in as president. Uh, 
January, uh, January 20th, 69. Uh, here's a quote. And those of you in the back may want to move up a little bit because there's a lot of writing on some of these slides. And I'm not sure you can see all of it from the back, but that's your choice. Uh, uh, Nixon and his associates made uh, recognized early on Apollo 11 was going to be a big deal, the first lunar landing, and he was going to be associated with it. And so they did a lot of things to associate Nixon with that. First of all, he had come to know a number of the Apollo astronauts and really liked them. Uh, one journalist said they were like the sons he never had because he only had two daughters. Uh, and in particular, the commander of Apollo 8, a man named Frank Borman, uh, uh, Nixon really resonated to, tried twice to talk Borman into being NASA administrator, uh, and brought Borman to the White House to advise him during all the Apollo 11 ceremonies and celebrations and aftermath. So there's a picture of, of Borman and Nixon uh, as a, the Apollo uh, spacecraft was being recovered after returning from the moon. The person in Navy White's is Admiral John McCain, He's the father of current, uh, current Senator John McCain of Arizona, who was commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet at that point. Uh, it was clear that Nixon wanted continuing human spaceflight. It was equally clear he did not want to give Kennedy any credit. He never mentioned the word Kennedy in any of the speeches or celebrations uh, of, of the uh, lunar landing. Um, Borman wrote a memo, which is kind of a cool thing to find in the archives, uh, de describing the Apollo 11 crew for the president in preparation for, for the mission. And these are kind of interesting and accurate descriptions of, 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 of the three men. Of course, uh, Neil has, has passed away in 2012, but Buzz and Mike are still very much alive. Buzz, even more than very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Borman uh, did a similar memo for Mrs. Nixon on, on the wives, and he, she descri he, he described uh, Mike Collins' wife as preferring candlelight dinners to all the astronaut hoopla, uh, which again was a pretty accurate description. Yeah. Uh, here's where I made the point. There was a proposal to name the spacecraft, what we know as Columbia, name it the John F. Kennedy. Uh, that got as far as Nixon's chief of staff, a man named Bob Haldeman, who wrote on a memo proposing, hell no, never, a double underline, two exclamation points. Uh, it's not clear that Nixon was in on this decision, but it's hard to imagine he was not. Over NASA's kind of skepticism of the value, they told him the astronauts are going to be in isolation. The, all you could do is see them through a little window. Uh, Nixon said, I want to go out and, and, and be there when they come back, and, and so he went. <laughs> kind of awkward. How many of you in here know who Billy Graham is? Uh, less than half. Billy Graham was a famous preacher evangelist who's had contacts in the White House forever. Uh, Billy Graham called Nixon and said, uh, in calling it the greatest week since creation, aren't you forgetting about Christ? Uh, <laughs> uh, But the question was still there after landing on the moon. You know, what do you do after you've been to the moon? Uh, and it fell to Nixon and his associates to make that decision. Uh, Nixon knew a fair amount about the space program. In the debate in 57 and 58, 
after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, Nixon had advocated a civilian space agency so it could do international cooperation rather than having the military be in charge of all U.S. space activity. He had advocated a more uh, ambitious program than uh, President Eisenhower had wanted. As he began his run for president in 1968, his second run for president, he was defeated by Kennedy in 1960, for those of you that don't know the history, uh, he said two things that were inconsistent with one another. One, space program must be second to none, and the other, space program is a place for the next president to cut the budget. I think those two uh, positions in tension with one another characterized his attitude through the period I'm talking about here. Uh, how did he organize for space policy? Well, he chose as science advisor a just retired president of a small Western engineering school called Caltech. Uh, a man named Lee Dubridge, who was the president here, became the science advisor to the president. And Dr. Dubridge shared the local prejudice that said that too much money was being spent on human spaceflight and not enough on, on space science and robotic activities. And he thought he could uh, have a major role in reshaping the post-Apollo program. That didn't work. Uh, then uh, there was a separate organization in the White House created in 1958 called the National Aeronautics and Space Council, headed by a vice president, Lyndon Johnson under Kennedy, but under Nixon, a man named Spiro Agnew. How many in here know who Spiro Agnew was? <laughs> he, he was a crook. Uh, he was the governor of Maryland. He got caught taking money bribes while he was working in the White House and resigned in disgrace. Uh, he wanted to, as head of the Space Council, exert his influence. That didn't work because he was marginalized. He, he did hire another Apollo 8 astronaut, Bill Anders, who came away very frustrated after his time working under Agnew. Kennedy had defined space as a national security, foreign policy, geopolitical issue. It was, after all, uh, the reason for going to the moon was to beat the Soviet Union there and demonstrate the superiority of the U.S. Uh, technological and, and, and uh, industrial system. Nixon didn't see space that way. He saw it as an issue of domestic policy like housing, social programs, and is space just another thing that governments did? And so he gave lead responsibility uh, for space policy in his inner circle to a man named Peter Flanagan, who was his link to the financial community, came off of Wall Street, knew nothing about space. And working for uh, Flanagan was a young 30-year-old uh, MIT doctorate uh, uh, named uh, Clay Thomas Whitehead, Tom Whitehead. And Tom was the day-by-day -day White House person overseeing uh, the civilian space program. And he had a very skeptical attitude, uh, saying uh, NASA is going to use the enthusiasm of, of Apollo 11 uh, to commit the country to a continuing large space program. That's not in the country's interest and not in the president's interest. Uh, he told the Bureau of the Budget the president wants to see the budget reduced. Whether he was actually reflecting the views of the president or his own views is an interesting question. Again, kind of political science lection, uh, lecture or lesson. Uh, young White House staff people often speak for the president without the president knowing what they're saying. Uh, ultimately, the decisions have to go up to the president at least many of them, but, but more decisions than you would like to think are made in the name of the president that the president doesn't know anything about. And I think at this point, Nixon was not thinking about these issues. By contrast, Nixon picked to head NASA after a couple of other more senior people uh, turned him down, a believer in the space dream, a believer in, in the, the future settlement of space and the expansion into the solar system. A man named Tom Paine. Uh, Dr. Paine had been 
deputy administrator, then acting administrator, unlikely choice. Uh, his wife, Tom Paine's wife, had campaigned for Hubert Humphrey against Nixon in the 68 election. He was a liberal Democrat, was kind of, nobody else wants the job, we'll give it to Paine. Turned out to be a mistake on, I think, a couple of sides. Paine never really understood what the Nixon White House wanted, was a naval submariner during World War II, uh, uh, fascinated by naval analogies, saw the space program as the equivalent of, of the Portuguese school of navigation spreading civilization out into the solar system. Even after his ambitions had been rejected, Paine was telling his associates NASA should be swashbuckling, uh, privateering, buccaneering, like Admiral Nelson and his band of brothers. That wasn't anywhere near what the Nixon administration wanted, and that tension clearly uh, showed up. So what Nixon did was set up in February of 69 a inside the government space task group chaired by the vice president to recommend what to do after Apollo. That group met during the summer in the excitement of the Apollo 11 mission. Payne brought the idea of building the future around missions to Mars in the 1980s, human missions to Mars in the 1980s, as the justification for, in the 70s, developing a large space station and kind of incidentally a supply vehicle for the space station called a shuttle. I mean, the reason it's called a shuttle is it was supposed to go back and forth to a, a first a 12 person, then a 50 person, then a 100 person space station. Here's what the group proposed. Uh, I don't think I have a, yeah, I do have a pointer over here. Even worse. This was the maximum proposal going to Mars in 81 or 83 or 86 uh, with a first space station in the mid 70s, a 12 person, doesn't say 12, but then a 50 man, women not yet, by the way, at that point, 100 man by 1985, lunar bases and nuclear uh, stages to go to the planets and, and, by the way, an Earth to orbit transportation system. This is where the shuttle came in. Uh, really bravado proposal that would have brought the NASA budget back up uh, to its Apollo level or higher. Uh, it was presented to Nixon September the 15th, 1969. This is the cabinet room with Nixon over here, Agnew here, uh, the other members of the space task group around the table. Uh, and the reaction to this proposal was, are you, basically, are you kidding? It was dead on arrival. It got caught up in Nixon's attempt to balance the budget after the years of Lyndon Johnson spending on the Great Society while conducting a war in Southeast Asia. Uh, the, Nixon and his associates were amateurs at running the executive branch. And the budget process was totally screwed up. Uh, so there were three different reductions in the budget before it became final in January of 70 and all of them, NASA's budget was reduced. This, I think, added up to the first major post-Apollo decision. There would be no more Apollos, no more large scale, fast paced, expensive exploratory uh, undertakings uh, by NASA, by the United States in the post-Apollo period. And as a result, oh, tapes. Feb Nixon put in a taping system two years after coming to the White House. Uh, the tape quality, by and large, is, is really horrible. The excerpts I'm going to play for you are not bad. Uh, uh, there were five microphones on, on the desk in the Oval Office, two by the fireplace where people sit and talk. The cabinet room was microphoned. The, hideaway office across the street in the executive office building. So there's a, a rich residue of, of, of very poor quality tapes to listen to. And pulling the space stuff out of that it was, was one of the tough parts, I guess I should say, of, of, of this uh, research project. Listen to this first excerpt, and you say Nixon would like a major space program. Well, 
A few weeks later, maybe in a more frank uh, exchange. So take your pick. Uh, the White House issued a statement in the president's name on March the 7th, 1970, uh, which said that space had to compete with other U.S. programs uh, for priority and for budget, uh, what had to become a normal and regular part of our national life, no longer being treated as special. I call this statement the Nixon Space Doctrine in the, not, it was not called that at the time, in the sense that it really has guided space policy since for 45 years. This is, I think, the governing uh, top-level policy approach of successful, successive presidents uh, to space policy decisions. We can debate that at the end of this if you want. What all of this meant, first of all, was that there would, after uh, Apollo, there would be no more for the indefinite future human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. First thing that NASA gave up in order to get money for future programs was the ability to produce more Saturn V moon rockets. Uh, it was a recognition that, that the Nixon administration was unlikely to approve any use of the Saturn V, which was a very expensive vehicle. With this decision, after spending billions of dollars to develop a heavy lift exploratory capability, the U.S. gave it up, uh, just dead stop. Uh, not only that, uh, but Apollo program itself was truncated. There were uh, six missions left after Apollo 11. Apollo 20 had been already canceled before uh, the Apollo 11 landing and its Saturn V converted into a temporary space station called Skylab. So there were missions through Apollo 19. NASA was very nervous about uh, the risks associated with these missions. Some of the people senior in human spaceflight said, President said, get people to the moon and get them back safely to Earth. We've done that. Let's quit while they're, we're ahead. Uh, with the budget outlook, NASA on its own decided to cancel two of the remaining six missions. Uh, so it wasn't Nixon that ended Apollo. It was the senior people, the, the administrator and deputy administrator of NASA and some of the other senior people in human spaceflight. So 15, which had been the last mission without a rover, was canceled. 19, which was the last mission, was canceled. And the uh, remaining missions renumbered, so what had been 16 became 15 and, and so on. Nixon was not a fan of the moon. I mean, even after two landings, he said, I don't see why we need to go back. In the fateful, very uh, risky Apollo uh, 13 mission, how many of you seen the Apollo 13 movie? See, now most of the people know the movies. Uh, he became very emotionally involved, even though uh, it's one of the areas where Henry Kissinger, his foreign policy advisor, was critical. He said, Nixon's worried about the astronauts and we're about to invade Cambodia. That's what he should be thinking about. But, but he was very much worried about uh, uh, the survival of the Apollo 13 crew. By the end of that year, he, of the remaining four missions, he started saying we should cancel one of them. And by the next year, 1971, he was saying, let's cancel two of the four, make Apollo 15 the last mission. Uh, kind of symbolic. Uh, in this top picture taken in December of 69, uh, the Apollo 8 Earthrise picture is in the uh, uh, Oval Office near the president's desk. Within a year and a half or so later, it was gone, replaced by a generic landscape. And it's kind of symbolic of his attitude. Uh, he discussed uh, the risks of another Apollo 13 hype accident impacting his outreach to China and Russia and his uh, uh, 
prospects for re-election in November of 72 in, in this conversation. You can read the rest of that. Uh, there will be, not be any launches between now and the election. And as Apollo 17, the last mission to go to the moon, left to head back to Earth, the White House issued a statement saying this may well be the last time in this century that Ben will walk on the moon. Well, by his decisions, Nixon made that come true. Uh, he did have an interesting idea from the get-go, which is that it would be good, good politics, good foreign policy, good symbolism to fly non-US people on American spacecraft. He called it his pet idea and kept pushing. Couldn't we do this? Couldn't we even put uh, a non-American on one of the Apollo missions? He was told no. Could we put it on the Skylab space station? No, there's a whole line of American astronauts waiting for a flight. So ultimately, it was not until the shuttle started flying that, that non-US people flew on US spacecraft. But you can reasonably say that Nixon was the father of international participation in our human spaceflight program. And he did approve the symbolic, uh, 40 years ago this year, Apollo Soyuz handshake and space mission. So this, I think, is one of the, his positive legacies. In trying to figure out what to do with NASA's capabilities after Apollo, a lot of people in the White House got fascinated with the idea of turning NASA into a general purpose technology agency using its capabilities to solve transportation, pollution, uh, uh, urban housing, whole sit laundry list of projects that were seemingly subject to a technological approach. Uh, the thing that started that was a, a fascination with the possibility of, of desalinization, particularly south of here, the Salton Sea and, 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 uh, and the Pacific, but particularly the Salton Sea. Uh, Nixon was very attracted. You see, he was, put it in NASA. What if we change the name of NASA? Uh, in talking to his budget director, uh, George Schultz, he, he said, an interesting attitude towards NASA. Uh, this idea persisted through the uh, summer and fall of 1971, ultimately collapsed of its own weight, and NASA went on just as an aeronautics and space agency. So the question is what to do with it. Uh, in 69 and through much of 1970, the top priority program had been a space station, with the shuttle serving to uh, be the supply vehicle for the space station. It became clear that neither the White House nor the Congress nor the uh, uh, aerospace community had much enthusiasm for the idea of a space station. And NASA in the summer of 1970 indefinitely deferred it uh, and said, no, we're going to do the shuttle first. I mean, you, can't, you can have a shuttle without a station, but you couldn't have a station without the shuttle. And if you couldn't do both, then station had to take, uh, shuttle had to take priority. Uh, but that meant you needed, a, if you didn't have a station, you had to have another justification for the shuttle. And it became, and it had been, think, people think about it all along, it became the launch vehicle for everything. So it had to be shown to be cheaper than alternatives and capable of doing things that existing launch vehicles didn't do. Uh, in a key, throw, it was meant as kind of a throwaway line, but in my analysis, a key uh, proposition was made by George Lowe after Tom Paine left NASA. Lowe wrote the head of, a deputy head of the budget uh, office saying, with the shuttle, the U.S. can have uh, a continuing program of manned spaceflight without a commitment to a major new uh, mission goal. 
when you think about it, that also has been a guiding principle for the past 45 years. No goal, operate the shuttle, at least through 2011. The shuttle idea had emerged as, as the station had uh, uh, gotten prominence in the late 60s. The space task group, the Agnew-led group in 68, uh, 69 said, why don't you look at the shuttle as a launch vehicle for everything, including national security missions, both military and intelligence. And there was a report, kind of classic and very influential report, came out in June of 1969 uh, that set the requirements for what a shuttle should be able to do. And I'll show you those in the middle in a minute. Uh, NASA spent over two years studying a two-stage booster the size of a 747, the orbiter, the top thing, size of a 767. At that time, you'd say 707. Uh, Space shuttle main engines, you're familiar with those, after the, the three in the back of the uh, space shuttle. It was also used in the booster. There were 12 of them back there. Uh, truly humongous vehicle uh, that NASA was proposing to develop. What were the requirements that drove the size and performance of the shuttle? Mainly national security, not exclusively, but mainly. The length of the payload bay, 60 feet, was driven by the need to launch the large photo intelligence satellites. There was one just coming online called Hexagon. You might know it as Big Bird or KH-9 if you follow this sort of thing. 60 feet long, 10 feet wide. And the anticipation even in 69 was that the following system would be equally as, as large, a system that would be in use during the 80s when the shuttle would be flying. The shuttle was supposed to be able to take off from Vandenberg Air Force Base up the road here uh, in, in Lompoc. Uh, and within 20 minutes, deploy a national security payload, then return to Vandenberg after one orbit and that required 1,100 miles of maneuvering cross-range because the Earth would have moved 1,100 miles in that 90 minutes of the orbit. Or the same mission, go up and, and rendezvous with and, and capture a national security payload and bring it back. Uh, 15 feet, both national security and uh, future space station modules, and how heavy the uh, payloads could be, were defined by some heavy national security payload. So the, the design of the shuttle that was ultimately built was defined, I would say, 70 to 80 percent by national security missions, footnote, that were never flown. Or most of them were never flown. Some, some of the rather more speculative uh, uses uh, suggested in this report. By the way, the report is still classified, but somehow the executive summary got declassified. So I was able to use this stuff. The idea that the shuttle could go up, inspect, and potentially destroy hostile satellites was part of the thinking at the start. Soviet Union in the late 1970s claimed the shuttle was an anti-satellite weapon. They were right, at least in the minds of some of the people that, that advocated the shuttle. The idea of flying over a crisis situation, taking images, landing back in Washington at Andrews Air Force Base, and rushing the images to the president within an hour or two. Uh, uh, the, these things, which seem rather science fiction-y, uh, uh, were seriously considered, at least by some. In 1971, mid-1971, well, in 1971, NASA decided it had to get a decision uh, uh, on the shuttle one way or another by the end of 71 to keep its engineering teams, its contractor teams, its centers busy. But in mid-71, it decided it couldn't build the shuttle it had been studying for two years, the two-stage fully reusable. It was technically too challenging and it would never fit in with the budget that NASA was told it would get during, the, at that time, six more years of the Nixon administration, presuming re-election. Uh, so in six months, the shuttle was totally redesigned. Uh, 
to find an alternative that the White House might approve. Uh, there was a new leader of NASA, a man, man named James Fletcher, uh, uh, who was the president of the University of Utah. It's interesting, uh, NASA had to compete, or the White House had to be, compete with him. He was about to be named the chancellor of UC San Diego, the new campus, this is 1971, uh, and, and he took the NASA job instead. Uh, you notice He's sworn in April the 27th, and the moon picture's already gone out of the Oval Office uh, over Nixon's shoulder. Uh, the people at the working level, last week ago Monday, I gave this talk in Houston to the people that designed and developed the shuttle, uh, who didn't want to hear what I had to say. Uh, I didn't get too much hostility, and nothing was thrown at me. Uh, they, they, they were off on their own, paying very little attention to the debate in Washington, having really no visibility into it. It's remarkable the disjoint uh, between the two. Uh, on the budget side, uh, the key actor was the second from the right, a man named Don Rice, uh, who had been a, a, a budget person in Robert McNamara's DOD, a system analyst trained by the RAND Corporation, later sec uh, president of the RAND Corporation and secretary of the Air Force. Uh, Don has an office in Century City today. He's still very active. I talked to him a couple times. After seriously considering giving up on getting approval for the shuttle, NASA, in its budget proposal uh, in September of 1971, made a kind of half-assed thing. It said, we'll build the airframe of a big shuttle but we'll use Apollo era engines, uh, electronics, avionics, thermal protection, won't be able to do all the things it's supposed to do. And then we'll hope five years later, uh, we can do a, a, a version two with modern technology. Uh, through all of this, the shuttle was being assessed as whether it was cost effective or not. A lot of voodoo economics related to that. Uh, and the White House, and particularly the Office of Management and Budget and the uh, Science Office, Office of Science and Technology, became convinced that it was a bad proposition for the United States, that, that it was uh, not a good investment, not something the country should be doing. And through this period, there was a rather bitter and very contested fight on, on, on whether to build a shuttle, and if so, what kind of shuttle to build. As this debate was taking forth, uh, what NASA didn't know is that Nixon had already approved the shuttle. Uh, the one space advocate in the higher levels of the Nixon White House was the deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget, later Secretary of Defense, a man from uh, San Francisco uh, named Casper Cap Weinberger. Weinberger wrote a memo to Nixon, you see just the start of it, uh, on, on the photo, but uh, the, the key quote on, on the left. This is the way Nixon made lots of his decisions. He'd get a memo, he'd take it home, upstairs in the White House, sit in the Lincoln Room, uh, music playing, usually Richard Rogers, perhaps a libation nearby. Uh, Nixon liked uh, scotch in particular. Uh, and, and write on these memos. So this is Nixon's handwriting saying, I agree with Cap. Uh, and essentially, Weinberger said, we should go ahead with the shuttle, and I can find the money to fund it. Nixon said, I agree. This was August before this whole debate took place. So the debate, NASA didn't know this, nor did the staff of the budget or science offices. So they were really debating what shuttle to build, because it was clear to Nixon and his associates, top associates, that there was going to be a shuttle. This is the positions that NASA put forward. You know, the United States has a responsibility if the Soviet Union is going to continue to fly people to have a part in manned space flight. For the U.S. not to be in space while others are is unthinkable. While this was Fletcher making this argument, Lowe was making an argument that, that uh, the best economic proposition was in this box where you could get uh, a, a per flight cost of $10 million 
with a development uh, cost of four to six billion dollars. Uh, the science people have been talking about a space glider, an unmanned, unpowered uh, kind of vehicle that would be launched two or three times a year. That was the upper left, uh, expensive to operate, uh, cheap to develop alternative that was, was rejected. Nixon, again, was pretty clear he was going to approve the shuttle, but the question is why? This is not Nixon. interesting uh, rationale for approving a multi-billion dollar program. Uh, Ehrlichman, I should explain, was his top policy assistant. Uh, and I did do an interview with him once he got out of jail. He went into jail after Watergate uh, along with some of the other senior people. Uh, by the start of December 71, there were really only two alternatives. The NASA design shuttle, which by that time the Mark I had gone away. It was full capability, advanced technology, 15 by 60 payload bay, all the, uh, meeting all the national security requirements. And OMB, supported by some of the NASA's contractors in kind of a backdoor operation, said, no, let's build it smaller. Uh, smaller payload bay, smaller weightlifting capability, cheaper, don't use advanced technology. Nixon decided to except OMB's recommendation at the meeting that's pictured here in, in his Key Biscayne uh, uh, retreat. Unfortunately, there were no tape recorders in that place. I've been interested to hear that discussion. Uh, NASA protested. The rest of December was spent arguing back and forth. Uh, finally, at the end of the month, NASA said the big shuttle was still the Best Buy, but they would settle for a slightly smaller one with 14 by 45 foot payload bay, so it couldn't do uh, uh, the photo intelligence satellites or what turned out to be Hubble was already planned. Uh, that this was something that they thought would be worth doing. The numbers are, this was the OMB shuttle, 10 by 30 foot payload bay with 30,000 pounds instead of 45 or 65,000 pounds of lifting capability. One of the things that's remarkable in retrospect was what NASA was promising. The operating cost per flight of the big one, the one that was ultimately built, $7.7 .7 million a flight. You know, five and a half billion development cost, and NASA came fairly close to matching that, but $7 million, where the shuttle cost about a billion dollars a flight. As far as I can tell, Nixon was not involved in these final decisions on what size shuttle to build. And so NASA had a, a meeting was set up to let him look like he was the one announcing the shuttle approval. It was out in San Clemente, January the 5th of 72. Here's the, the press at, at a photo op. Uh, a name had been chosen. The shuttle was supposed to be called the Space Clipper. Uh, Nixon at the meeting, Nixon himself said, I don't like that, let's worry about a name later, and so keep it the space shuttle, and the space shuttle it stayed. Uh, they talked about whether it was a $7 billion toy, NASA of course said no, uh, and the statement the White House issued after the meeting had the President say, the shuttle will revolutionize transportation into space by routinizing it, it will take the astronomical costs out of astronautics. Those were the promises that were made for the shuttle that were never kept. So that's the history. That's how we got a shuttle. You know, what do I think about evaluating Nixon's uh, space policy decisions? Uh, 
I think there were three lower ambitions. Treat the space program not as special, but as just one of many uh, programs competing for priority and to build the program around a, a, a means, a capability to shuttle without any particular purpose the shuttle would serve. I think the, the first two, you could argue, and I do in the book, that Nixon may have been right. I mean, the space community would say he made a big mistake by lowering the priority and not treating space as special. It deserves to be special. We, we in the community have spent the past 40 plus years uh, saying raise the budget, uh, give it more attention, give it higher priority. But you could also argue that Nixon correctly uh, assessed public opinion, assessed the fact that there was no compelling reason to treat the space program as, as a, a special off, off the budget competition area. Uh, Tom Whitehead, for example, said there's no compelling reason f to push uh, space ever presented to Nixon and his associates. Uh, what has happened in this priority competition is that NASA has done poorly. From 1% of the budget from 2 to 3% of the budget in the Nixon period down to 1%, now it's 0.45%. But NASA's never adjusted its ambitions. So what you have, we on the Columbia board in 2003 observed, is an agency trying to do too much with too little, uh, and, and the result is, is organizational stress. I think that's true today. Uh, Last year, the National Research Council, the National Academy, took a look at, at, at the program and said, uh, you can't have a successful human spaceflight program on annual budgets, as required by the Nixon Doctrine. But that's what we have. So does that mean we're not ever going to have a successful program? Turning to the shuttle, why did Nixon approve the shuttle? I, I see three reasons. One was as a symbol of American leadership and uh, uh, of the U.S. as a great nation. His interest in the various national security uses of the shuttle and the employment impacts uh, in prior to his 1972 re-election. Again, I have to say this is end of 1971, the start of 1972. Nixon's opponent for 72 uh, election was a senator named Ed Muskie, who self-destroyed uh, in early 72, and Nixon was running behind in the polls, and he knew he had to have California to win re-election. So the jobs in California was an extremely important element of his political calculation. I don't think for Nixon and his top people, the fact that the shuttle was supposed to be routine and cheap were that influential, but certainly those were the promises that NASA made to the country. Why, again, this is Nixon after the shuttle decision, talking to people from New York because Grumman Aerospace in, in Long Island was the other competitor for the shuttle contract. Uh, I think it was foreordained. They weren't going to get it, but they didn't know that. And it's perhaps disheartening to see how these decisions are made. People shouldn't come to Washington if they don't like seeing messy uh, processes. Uh, in terms of the criteria that Nixon used for evaluating, I think that in terms of leadership and, and symbolizing America as a great nation, shuttle was a resounding success. So, you know, if you say that's enough, to justify the over $200 billion that was spent, spent on the shuttle, then the shuttle was a positive success. I, I have mixed feelings about that. It did not provide, or it, the capabilities it could have provided to the national security community were never used. The national security community uh, did not want to be dependent on the shuttle. And first were forced into designing their uh, uh, satellites to fit on the shuttle building $6 billion launch site for the shuttle at Vandenberg, 
a control center in Colorado. Then after the Challenger accident, the national security community was able to get off of its dependence on the shuttle and had to redesign everything. Total cost anywhere between 20 to $50 billion of that uh, in and out thing. And I, the space program is a jobs program, and I think Nixon started it, for better or for worse. Uh, in terms of cost, uh, and even after the decision, uh, the NASA administrator was saying $10 million a flight. That would be about $60 million in this year's dollars. The actual cost, as NASA estimated, is somewhere between $800 million and $1 billion, too. Uh, so 20 times higher than the estimated cost. Shuttle was supposed to fly 40 to 60 times a year. It's average over 35 years, 135 flights, 30 years was 4.3 flights a year. I quote former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin, what the shuttle does is stunning, but it's stunningly less than what was predicted. One thing that was sure was once you built the shuttle, NASA was gonna go back and then ask for space station approval. Shuttle was designed to launch modules of a space station among its other design criteria. That's what happened. Uh, I argue that, that, that the space station was preordained by the shuttle, even though it was President Reagan that approved the space station, and that operating those, developing and operating the station and the shuttle until the station was assembled in 2011 created what I call mortgages. About eight to nine billion dollars a year of the NASA budget had to go into those two programs, and that meant there was no money for anything new in human spaceflight uh, on the level budget that, that came out of the Nixon Space Doctrine. The same young man, Tom Whitehead, was very perceptive, and he said in early 71, uh, these, observations about uh, uh, post-Apollo issues. Uh, NASA is both drifting, lobbying, uh, doesn't focus realistically on what it should be doing, should be making a transition from razzle-dazzle growth to organizational maturity. There needs to be a sense of direction. And a kind of key question, which I think has never been answered, what do we expect of a space program? So, what is the Nixon space heritage? Uh, the positives, uh, we wouldn't explore, but we would continue human spaceflight on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, we would focus on developing capabilities for low Earth orbit. We would engage other countries in that activity in low Earth orbit. I should put a parenthesis in here, given where I'm talking, uh, and I'm doing the same talk at, at JPL tomorrow. There's a whole story about uh, space science and robotic missions in parallel uh, with this, which I uh, have chosen not to tell. I think Eric Conway in his new book has uh, about the decisions to define the, the uh, robotic program. Uh, I go back to this 1970 proposal by George Lowe, which I think ended up being the governing proposal of the shuttle and, and really the shuttle program as it existed until 2011. And you see the various comments that NASA lacks a strategic focus, that there is no strong direction, the future of human spaceflight is unclear. To me, that is Richard Nixon's most fundamental uh, space heritage. And that's what I've got to say. Floor is open for rebuttal, comments, questions.